ni Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the extremely important discussions on khums is the discussion on tahleel al khums. We have a number of narrations that indicate at the time of the ghaybah or at other times during the life of the Imams, the khums was no longer made wajib. It was wajib, but then the Imams issued a command of tahleel to make it halal. You're no longer obligated to pay the khums. Today, this is a very controversial topic. You will find many people talking about tahleel al-khums, that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have made it lawful for us, we, we don't have to pay the khums. But then later scholars in the seminaries, they came in history and they imposed this khums on people because they found this as a great way to financially get something out of the people, to run their projects or spend it on themselves. That's how the misconception goes. So in tonight's discussion, we will examine tahleel al-khums. We'll examine the narrations that speak about the khums being not wajib and we'll come to a conclusion what the scholars have stated about the uh, khums and why it's still mandatory even though we have these hadiths. We have three categories of hadiths. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The first category of hadiths that we have are hadiths that simply state the Shia in particular are not obligated to pay the khums. For instance, we have a hadith from Al Imam Al Baqir alayhi salam. He says, Qala Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Al Imam Al Baqir narrates from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Halakan nasu fi butunihim wa furujihim. People will perish because of their stomachs and their private parts, their chastity. Why? Because they did not give us, the Ahlul Bayt, our right, meaning our khums, our share. Then the Imam states, Ala wa inna shi'atana min thalika wa aba'ahum fi hil. As for our Shia, we have released them from this obligation. They don't have to pay our share, which is the khums, we've made it legal for them to keep it for themselves. This is a sahih hadith by the way, the chain of transmission is a solid chain that scholars have accepted. We don't have someone who's not reliable or someone who's not anonymous. So this is an example of the first category. Another hadith is a sahih hadith which Zurara narrates from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. He confirms the same idea and he mentions the word khums. He said, Inna Amir al Mu'minin halalahum min al khums. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he declared the khums halal, you don't have to pay it for the Shia. Why? Liyatiba mawliduhum. So that their birth would be legitimate. We'll examine what these hadiths mean. I'm just sharing with you the hadiths. Another hadith that we have which considers the khums halal is a hadith by Al-Harith ibn al-Mughira al-Nasri. It's a longer hadith, I will share with you this last part of the hadith. The Imam tells the narrator, his name was Najiyya or Nujayya, Najiyya. He says, Ya Najiyya, inna lana al-khums fi kitab Allah. In the book of Allah, Allah has given us the khums. This is in the Quran. 
ولنا الأنفال ولنا صف المال. He mentions other categories that the Ahlul Bayt have, like the Anfal, until he said, اللهم إنا قد أحللنا ذلك لشيعتنا. Oh Allah, we have made this halal for our Shia. They don't need to pay the khums, the anfal, any of this money. So this is a clear hadith. The fourth one is a very popular hadith. It's the hadith which basically validates the system of marja'iyya. It's a tawqi' attributed to Imam al-Mahdi. It's a letter attributed to the Imam alayhi salam. In the beginning of this statement, the Imam says, وَأَمَّا الْحَوَادِثُ الْوَاقِعَ فَرْجُعُوا فِيهَا إِلَىٰ رُوَاتِ حَدِيثِنَا When new things come up in your affairs, refer back to the narrators of our hadiths, those who are experts in our hadiths, basically the scholars, those who are familiar with our hadith. فَإِنَّهُمْ حُجَّتِي عَلَيْكُمْ They are my hujjah, my proof on you. وَأَنَا حُجَّةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ And I, Imam al-Mahdi is saying this in this tawqi' I am the hujjah of Allah on you. Now whether the chain of this letter is authentic or not, scholars have different opinions, but many scholars have accepted this. Interestingly, Imam al-Mahdi in this letter says, after saying this, he says, وَأَمَّا الْخُمْسِ You ask us about the khums, here's my answer. فَقَدْ أُبِيحَ لِشِيَعَتِنَا The khums? has been made permissible for our Shia to keep. وَجُعِلُوا مِنْهُ فِي حِلْ They're not obligated to pay it. إِلَىٰ وَقْتِ ظُهُورِنَا or ظُهُورِ أَمْرِنَا Until when are they not liable to pay the khums? They're not obligated to pay the khums. Until our reappearance. Why? لِتَطِيبَ وِلَادَتُهُمْ وَلَا تَخْبُثْ So that their birth is legitimate. So this is the first category of hadiths that we have. In this first category, we find that the khums has been made halal, tahleel al khums. You're not obligated to pay it. And we have sahih hadiths, the, the, the chain of these hadiths is very solid. This is one category. Let's examine the second category. The second category are those hadiths which say khums is wajib. It's an obligation. And the Imams are speaking to their Shia, you have to pay it, it's mandatory. I'll share with you some examples of the second category. So for instance, in this category, we have a hadith that a Shaykh al-Tusi narrates from Muhammad ibn Zayd al-Tabari, he says, قَدِمَ قَوْمٌ مِنْ خُرَاسَانِ إِلَىٰ أَبِي الْحَسَنِ A group of people came from Khurasan to meet Al-Imam Abu al-Hasan. Who's Abu al-Hasan? Al-Imam al-Rudha alayhi salam in this hadith. فَسَأَلُوهُ أَنْ يَجْعَلَهُمْ فِي حِلٍ مِنَ الْخُمْسِ They pleaded with the Imam, they tried to negotiate with the Imam to free them from the obligation of khums. They asked him, we know we have to pay khums, please make it halal for us, let's be off the hook, release us from this obligation. فَقَالَ The Imam السلام, became upset and he responded. He says, مَا أَمْحَلَ هَذَا He says, this is so unfair what you're coming with. تَمْحُضُونَنَا بِأَلْسِنَتُكُمْ وَتَزْوُونَ عَنَّا حَقَّنَا When it comes to words and speech, mashallah, you claim to love us with your tongues. But when it comes to our right, the khums, you want to deny us our right? Is this fair? وَتَزْوُونَ عَنَّا حَقًّا جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ لَنَا And it is the khums. How is it that you want to deny us? لا نجعل لا نجعل لا نجعل لأحد منكم في حل. We will not. The Imam says it three times. We will not. We will not. We will not accept this proposal that you have. You have. You are liable for paying the khums. Okay. So in the second category, we have hadiths that clearly state the khums is wajib, and that Al Imam Rida refused to free his followers, the Shia, 
from this obligation and the Imam even found it offensive. You claim to love us the Ahlul Bayt but you deny us our right. This is, this is one example. The second example is an interesting one. al kulayni narrates this in Al-Kafi. An Ibrahim, an Abi, Ibrahim is the narrator, he narrates this from his father. He says, Kuntu inda Abi Ja'far al-Thani. I was by Al-Imam Abu Ja'far al-Thani. Who's Abu Ja'far al-Thani? Al-Imam al-Jawad, salamullahi alayhi. إِذْ دَخَلَ عَلَيْهِ صَالِحْ إِبْنْ مُحَمَّدْ إِبْنْ سَهْلْ This man came to see Al-Imam Al-Jawad. وَكَانَ يَتَوَلَّى لَهُ الْوَقْفَ بِقُمْ In the city of Qum, this man was in charge of overseeing the religious endowments, the waqf, like the religious properties that were dedicated to a charitable cause. فَقَالَ سَيِّدِي He came to negotiate and plead with the Imam. اجعلني من عشرة آلاف درهم في حل فإني قد أنفقتها. He said, Imam, ten thousand dirhams, silver coins, I spent them. Please make this halal for me. Apparently, he spent it on himself, not on the project. The Imam عليه السلام told him, أنت في حل. Okay, fine. I make that lawful for you. Here's the interesting part. فلما خرج صالح when this man صالح who asked the Imam to give him permission for spending that 10,000. When he left, Al-Imam Al-Jawad states, أَحَدُهُمْ يَثُبُ عَلَىٰ أَمْوَالِ آلِ مُحَمَّدْ وَأَيْتَامِهِمْ وَمَسَاكِينِهِمْ وَأَبْنَاءِ سَبِيلِهِمْ فَيَأْخُذَهُ ثُمَّ يَجِئْ فَيَقُولْ اِجْعَلْنِي فِي حِلْ The Imam became angry. He said, one of them takes the money of Al Muhammad, the Khums, and the money that belongs to the poor, to the miskeen, to those who have a right in it, he spends it on himself. Then he comes to me and he says, make this halal for me. The Imam alayhi salam states, He would think that I would say no. When he's coming here in front of others and he, he puts me in a difficult position, what am I going to say? I'm going to say no. So people think maybe I am greedy and I want this money for myself. The place he asked was not the appropriate place, right? The Imam Ali Salam states, Wallah layas alannahum Allahu yawm al qiyama an dalik su alan hathitha. I swear he's liable for that. Allah will ask him on the day of judgment. Now you could argue, well, if this is how the Imam feels, then why didn't he tell him? The Imam Ali Salam says he should know better. This is the haq of those who should receive the khums. Why is he even asking me for this? And he puts me on the spot. It's embarrassing for the Imam to say, no, you have to give it to us because it could send the wrong image. Maybe there were, you know, foreigners there. Maybe there were spies by the Abbasids. Remember, the Abbasids were very sensitive about money going to the Ahlul Bayt. Maybe there was a spy there, someone loyal to the government. So this guy, he comes and in a public setting, he asked the Imam. Of course, the Imam said, okay, fine. You're free from paying it. So you see in this second category, we have clear hadiths that the Ahlul Bayt refused to make it halal. That's the second category. Question, and this is what scholars do in fiqh, in Islamic law. We have the first category that says it's halal. You don't have to pay it. The second category says you have to pay it. Allah will ask you, even if the Imam himself tells you you're off the hook, you still have to pay because you shouldn't even ask a question like that. It's not fair for you to do something like that. Now there seems to be a contradiction between these two categories. What do we do? How do we resolve this contradiction? Any ideas? Yes, but I'll get to it. Yes, brother. Any ideas on how we can resolve this contradiction? Maybe the first category applies only, like there was a context applies only in certain situations. Maybe the first category applies to a particular situation. The context of it is limited. It's not an all out declaration that khums is halal. So we have to see if it was issued in a particular context. That's one step going forward. That's, that's a very good point, yes. I was gonna say the time frame which uh, 
Well, see, I mentioned four hadiths. Some of them are from Imam Ali. Some of them are from Imam Al-Baqir. And the last one is from the letter of Imam Al-Mahdi. In which he says, Khums is halal until we reappear. Until the zuhur. So we've got different eras. Time-wise, we're looking at different eras. If it was just one Imam, we could have said in that particular time, the Khums may have been made halal. But we've got multiple eras. So... That's a difficult route to take in reconciling between the hadiths. Any other ideas? Let's say you now as a scholar, you're looking at these two groups of hadiths and they're sahih. In the first category you have sahih hadiths, in the second category you have sahih hadiths. What do you do? Okay, ihtiyat, precaution. First of all, before arriving at precaution, we want to see technically how do we deal with these hadiths. Secondly, what would the ihtiyat be? Pay khums or not pay? Is that ihtiyat? If a scholar says as ihtiyat you have to pay khums, it's a little bit problematic because if you really did not have to pay khums, then the scholar is obligating you to pay money that belongs to you. That could be against ihtiyat. Either your right is taken or the right of the recipient of khums is taken, right? So where's the ihtiyat here? Imagine the imams really made it legal, halal. So that means the 20% is yours. On what basis is the marja' giving it to others? How is that ihtiyat? Yes, mustahab ihtiyat is fine. Recommended ihtiyat. If you'd like to know that you've definitely freed your obligation, freed yourself from the obligation, you give it. But he cannot mandate you. It cannot be even ihtiyat wujubi. Does it depend on your financial status? Does it depend on your financial status? So if, if the person's poor, they're struggling to make ends meet, they don't even have to pay khums to begin with. But maybe if someone's well off, they have a lot of money, then they have to pay khums. But on what basis would we say that though? Like what's the proof for this scholar to say something like that? One hadith says, khums has been made lawful, you don't have to pay it. Another hadith says, no, you still have to pay it. So one way of reconciling them is to say, if you're wealthy, pay khums, but where's the evidence for that? See, scholars need evidence. On the day of judgment, they have to back up their fatwa. They can't come and say, okay, only those who were wealthy they had to give. Allah will ask them, well, how'd you come up with that conclusion? Is there evidence in the hadith? So we need like solid evidence to reconcile, not just any possibility. What you mentioned could be a possibility, but it's not a certainty. We need certainty here. Or something that gives us confidence. Yes. Are we assuming we went to the Quran before or is this a step we do after? Do see, see in the first step last year we examined the evidence from Quran. There's no doubt that khums has been made wajib. So there's no doubt about the obligation of khums. The question is after it was made an obligation, did the Imams relieve us from this obligation or no? That's the whole discussion of Tahleel al Khums. So, all these hadiths are in agreement that Khums is wajib. But here's the question Did the Imams lift this wujub or no? They did not. That's the question. So, they're in agreement about this point that it's in the Quran, it was made wajib. At some points, even the Imams would collect it. But did they lift that wujub or no? That's the question. <coughs> It's a, it's a love from um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you, they can probably, at a certain time when they said it was halal, there was a reason for it, but then they cannot lift it completely. Well, in that tawqi' of Imam al-Mahdi, in that letter, he lifted it until the zuhur. So during the time of ghaybah, it's been lifted. The Imam can do that without... Yes, he's authorized by Allah. Because the khums is primarily the haqq of Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. And the Imam has the right to relinquish that right. And he has the right from the Prophet ﷺ to make such legislations. Yes, he does have the right. This is called, uh, you know, al, uh, in, in, uh, we could call it the legislative authority, right? Tashri'iyah in Arabic we call it. al wilaya tashri'iyah the legislative authority of the Imams. So they do have such a right. Yes, brother. We said that, that uh, Allah has made uh, religion not uh, difficult for followers. 
and comparing Homs with Zakat for just a normal people. Homs is incredibly complicated. I mean, it, based on all this stuff that you, know, you have mentioned. If we take the cross-section of a society where you would have, uh, in any given society usually, I would say like there is no more than 20% say Sayyid and 80% non Sayyid. If most people would never pay zakat to non Sayyid and everything goes as homes to Sayyid, I think those societies will collapse, I would think. So, you know, with all of these things, I don't know how to conclude it, but I would say that, you know, there is a stronger case to say, well, either it's on everyone, more like 2.5% that everyone has to pay, or See, brother, last year we did examine that wa that zakat is wajib. There's no doubt about that. Sunnis and Shia both agree zakat is wajib. The only disagreement is on which categories. We accept the 2.5% when it comes to livestock, when it comes to crops. Yes, when it comes to even currency, like gold and silver. Paper currency, that's where the Shias differ with the Sunnis. The Shia say we don't have evidence that zakat is wajib on paper currency because the Imams clearly told us what zakat is wajib on. So we are in agreement about zakat. Every one of you has to pay zakat if you own assets in those categories. So we're not limiting it to a particular you know, group of people. Everyone has to pay zakat assuming they deal with those categories. Now it's still mustahab to pay zakat on the other you know, paper currency or any type of profit, scholars say basically it's mustahab. Now remember the khums doesn't just go to the Sayyids, it goes to the Imams share half of it and that's what's funding the Hausa institutions, that's what's funding charitable projects, printing books, uh, anything that helps with religious matters, right? Even humanitarian uh, projects, hospitals, orphanages. So if all of society is paying to that khums, it's not only going to a small segment who are the Sayyids, it's going to all these projects as well. Let's now examine these hadiths and see what we can do about them. Remember the first category in which the Imams stated, we've lifted the wujub of khums. Why? What is the philosophy and the reasoning that these hadiths mentioned? Like the tawqi' of the Imam in which he states لِتَطِيبَ وَلَادَتُهُمْ وَلَا تَخْبُثْ What is this reasoning that the Imam is giving us? Why is the khums lifted from the Shia? The Imam he himself is telling us the reasoning behind it. What is this reasoning? Make to make the birth legitimate. What does legitimate birth, your child being halal, a legitimate child, not a haram, not an illegitimate child. What does that have to do with khums? That's the key to bringing reconciliation between these two hadiths. That will tell you the context. But the brother mentioned the context, right? This will tell us what the context is. Can someone figure that out? What does legitimate birth have to do with paying khums? Let's say someone doesn't pay khums, right? Somebody who lives who doesn't pay khums. Okay, he's confiscating 20%. But how is that illegitimate children? Your children are still halal. What does that have to do with... 20% of your children are not for you. Okay, that means 20% of your children are not for you, right? Well, you don't legally own your children for that to be an issue. Islamically, if there's a valid marriage contract, and then there is birth, it's a halal birth. You mean the mahar? Dowry? Okay, the brother says dowry. 20% of the dowry that you give to your wife did not belong to you. Okay, you're liable for that 20%, but does that make the child illegitimate? Yeah. Imagine a husband, imagine a husband, a husband says, I deny my wife the dowry. Okay, that's a sin in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She deserves the dowry. But are the, are the children haram? Of course not. If you deny the entire dowry, the children are still halal children. They're shari children. <laughs> yes. The food? Okay, the food that you eat. There, there is a discussion about our sins having an impact on our progeny, right? 
But if someone eats haram food, in fact you steal food, or you steal money, or you work in a haram business, legally your children, if you're in a valid marriage, legally your children are not halal children? No, they are halal children. So what does this issue of legitimate birth have to do with khums? I'll give you a hint. Don't think of a wife that you marry. Think of other ways at the time people had children. So according to the Quran, how does a woman become halal to a man? One is marriage, as wajihim. Well that's still marriage. Exactly, someone mentioned it. slaves. Basically here's the discussion. The Quran says, أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ Right? If you own a slave legally, then you know it was very common for the person to have children from that slave and they would be his legitimate children. Question, if someone steals a slave from its previous owner, steals a slave, right? Or take someone as a slave who's not a slave and you have children from that person, what are the children? They're haram. Islam does not recognize those as being your halal children. Imagine someone takes a slave, he steals her and then he has children from her. These children are haram, this is rape, this is like rape, it's haram children. So what happens to the children? They are, they are illegitimate children, that's a whole discussion on what happens with illegitimate, illeg illegitimate children, but they are not shar'i children. Okay, question, if you own half of the slave, let's say there are two partners who own a slave. The first one owns 50% of the slave, the second one owns the other 50%. If without the consent and the permission of the other owner, the first person, the first partner has children from the slave, what happens to those children? They're not shar'i children because the person did not fully own the slave so he did not have that right. Yes, because slave was treated as property. Sometimes you had three persons owning a slave. So if the slave would be sold, they would get the, their share. Or sometimes they would own a slave. So one day the slave would work for this master, another day the slave would work for another master. Yeah, this was very common. You can all have an affair with it? No, no, no. Having an affair, only one can have an affair. Because the slave who has an affair is like a wife. So no, no. If you have five masters owning a slave, uh, only one of them can treat her like his wife, of course. <laughs> Islam did not accept that in any way. We're talking about owners in terms of the value of the slave, like the monetary value. They could be partners in that, but, but not in other things, of course. Okay, so now if a, if a master, if a person owned a slave and he owned only 80% of that slave, not 20%, could he have children with, from her legally? No, he cannot. He needs the consent of the other 20%. Apply this to Khums. At the time, there were wars, there were slave markets, and those governments, those rulers would bring in these slaves. Now slaves who are captured in war, who do they belong to initially? The Prophet they're a part of the Anfal or the Haq of the Prophet, or the one who represents the Prophet. See, Islam wants even in times of battle to make sure that the battle is just, there is no injustice, and the way through which these slaves were acquired is just. Islam said you need the Prophet or his representative there. You can't just go and wage war and take people as slaves like the Umayyads did, like the Abbasids did, like these corrupt governments. There must be a justification for that war, right? So what, would, what did these governments do? They would wage a war, they would collect these slaves, these slaves belonged to the Imam's share, these slaves belonged to the Imam السلام, because if you remember last year we mentioned one of the categories on which Khums applies is what? Spoils of war. These slaves would be captured at the time of war, so they are spoils of war. 20% of the spoils of war must go to the Prophet or his representative the Imam. So these slaves when they were brought to the market, 20% of them was owned by the Imams. So anybody who's, who bought these slaves did not own 20% of them. 
So when they would take them, buy them, have children from them, this was illegitimate birth. Now imagine the consequence on society. So what did the Imams do to relieve their Shia? The Imam السلام, says all of our Shia, because of their faith, because they recognize our authority, we have lifted this burden from them. Any slave they buy from the market or any slave that you know they have, we've made it halal for them so the birth of their children becomes legitimate. See this point here, this fundamental point here? Having said that, how do we understand the context of these hadiths? This hadith is not saying all homes of the income and the businesses and everything has become halal for you and the, and the wujub has been lifted. That's not the context they're talking about. They're talking about a situation that has to do with legitimate birth. What is that situation? Slaves. So now we've resolved the contradiction. That's the first method to resolve the contradiction. Yes. What about the last hadith from Imam al Mahdi? Because that one didn't seem like it was about slaves. It was about like his disappearance. Like well, basically, he he. There were a few questions in the letter asked. The Imam is answering them. Once he gets to the khums, he says, "As for the khums, we have lifted it from our Shia until my reappearance. Why?" in order for their birth to, to be legitimate. That means in our ghaybah, you don't have access to the Imam to ask him, Imam, I got the slave, you own 20% of it, right? The Imam said, when I'm absent, I've already given my permission. When I come, yes, then we'll deal with it. Then when the Imam comes, he'll tell us what the law is. So he was just talking about the time of ghaybah, how do we deal with, with this khums? But from the justification the Imam mentions, mentions, we know he's not talking about all categories of khums. He's talking about a category that has to do with legitimate birth. So their birth becomes legitimate. Well, which type of khums is impacted by this? By this concept of legitimate birth? The, the issue of slaves. Otherwise, the income, everything else doesn't have an impact on the legitimacy of your children on them being legitimate children. That's how we understand it. So this is one way that scholars have resolved this apparent contradiction. Hence all those, khums, all those hadiths that, that say khums is wajib, it's wajib. And all these hadiths that lift the burden, they're lifting the burden from this particular category. So we, we lifted on his followers, what about the other school? It's not lifted from them, lifted. no. That's why the Imam says Allah will ask them on the Day of Judgment. Because they took the right of us Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet made it clear to all Muslims, the Ahlul Bayt have a right. You deny the right, there's consequences. Now Allah will forgive them, the Ahlul Bayt will forgive them, that's another issue. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment can hold them accountable and told them you stole all that property. That did not belong to you. Just like Fadak when they confiscated it from the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. So yeah, that is a very important concern. From other Muslims, this has not been lifted. And that is, that is problematic, that is problematic. <laughs> so this is one way that scholars have examined this issue. There's a second way, we'll examine it on Wednesday inshallah.